Hello folks, uh, this is Jasa Mudluk from the KSR's project and in this video I will guide you to using ECUS astrography tool within KSR's and um, as before this is, is another live session so I will explain things as I go on. Uh, today I have all my equipment connected to Raspberry Pi sitting on the roof and the cold weather while I'm sitting here recording this in the warmth of my living room. So this is one of the really neat features about Indy in Ecus, the remote connectivity aspect. And so um, let's go ahead and connect to Raspberry Pi as a search into it. Let's put the password. And I already compiled uh, ND and all the necessary drivers here, so let's start that. Let's start ND server dash vector vector for verfus. And let's put the drivers. So the first driver will be ND EQ mod telescope to control my um, Orion series mount. Then ND QSI CCD. And then for my load star and the starlight express ccd and finally in the moonlight focuser and you'll notice here that we have the corporate name because this is the driver name in the equipment telescope is the driver uh, name itself but we not we need for the remote connectivity to know the device name so the device name is actually eq mod space mount for uh, Starlight Express, for example, here's a driver, and the uh, name is SX CCD Lodestar. So we have to use this exact name in ECUS configuration if we want to do any remote connectivity. If it's local connectivity, we don't have to worry about that. So now let's go back to uh, case stars. We'll go to Tools, then ECUS, and then we have here in the setup page two modes which is local mode or remote mode by default it's local which means all the equipment are connected locally to the same PC running case stars in our case we'll be doing remote so let's go to options because let's put the remote server IP address here which is the Raspberry Pi IP address and let's put the port 7624 Let's put the equipment name, QMOD mount, SICCT, and final and moonlight. Alright, I think we all got them right. Let's go back to EQS, change to remote, and then connect. All right, so now I have all my equipment connected. Sorry, not connected. All my equipment started. I haven't connected yet. Um, I only need to change the port on the Ikima driver. So it's actually port TTY USB 1. And all my equipment upstairs are connected to uh, a powered USB hub because the Raspberry Pi cannot take all these devices. So it's really recommended to use a powered USB hub to connect all your equipment. Okay, I think we're set. So let's go ahead and connect. All right, and we're connected. That's really nice. And let's go here, okay, stars. And see, it's looking roughly, when I powered my telescope, I made it look roughly at north. So, um, there's no alignment points done yet, but this is where it's, it's it thinks it looks looking at. So typically, um, the first thing I have to do is I check if my telescope is focused, oh sorry, my CCD is focused. But before that, let's select a sort of a star for focusing, something between a third and a fourth magnitude star. Okay, let's look here in Cassiopeia. That's 3.35, that's good enough. Let's go to EQ mode and track. Alright, so now our telescope is moving to uh, this star, Navi, Epsilon, Cassiopeia. 
and of course it's not going to be centered there because it's not really aligned yet but we're just going to use that location to to focus the telescope all right so this is the focus module of ECUS and it might look intimidating at first but it's actually pretty straightforward uh, here we select the CCD, the exposure time we want to use and the pinning and here are any filters we want to apply to the image to enhance it and so uh, let's use auto stretch and here we have a warning we should not supposed to use this if we want to do autofocus but here we're just going to do framing for now just to take a look at the image. Here we select the focuser and there are two modes manual and auto. We'll now use manual just to check roughly the focusing because then it cannot be too awful. The the stars have to be resol resol resolvable if that's a word. They have to be resolved uh, by the algorithm in order for the autofocus algorithm to work. Um, so let's do go ahead and start framing now. So this will just take continuous exposures, each one is half a second. And uh, the QSI is, is quite uh, um, slow. Alright, I think this is uh, reasonable. It's not really highly focused, but it's uh, the stars are, are, are fine. This is something the autofocus algorithm can work on. So let's go ahead and stop. Let's remove the auto stretch. And let's select here auto and here the autofocus options let's look at that auto select stars means it will take a capture and it will automatically determine the best focus star so we'll make it do that here subframe it will subframe the focus star so that it will just select whatever subframe necessary for that particular star doesn't have to download the full image that will make the focusing faster and here this is suspend guiding it will suspend guiding if it was starting we don't we don't have any guiding going on right now so here the step size is the number of ticks it moves initially uh, so it has to be sufficient enough to result in a change in HFR which is a half flex radius it's, this is the method we use to uh, find the the uh, our gauge the, the focusing of the star if it's focused or out of focus um, so this the step has to be just sufficient enough to, to make a noticeable change in the HFR value and this the algorithm then will determine the number of steps necessary later on um, the max travel this is like it, it cannot travel more than 300 ticks it has to stop before that and the tolerance value is how much accuracy we want to gain from this algorithm and it's put at 1% so uh, that's the default value and that's good um, in my condition at least and you can change it uh, as you see fit. Finally here we have the filter and uh, here we're selecting the luminosity filter for the autofocus operation and we're locking the filter me which means that in case we do something here in the CCD module is called in sequence focusing meaning um, let's take for example if we're capturing an image in H alpha and after that image we need to do autofocusing it has to resort back to the luminosity filter to do that operation and after it finishes from the autofocus operation it goes back to whatever filter it was on okay so enough talking let's go ahead and start the autofocus operation so we just simply click start focus and now uh, fingers crossed hopefully it will select all right. So, all right. So it selected the star. So nine seven one. That's and this is the V curve. So six zero nine. It's getting better. All right. You can see the the shape of the V curve. 0.52 that's really getting really close 591 this is the other side of the V curve now I think it has to go back here some value here all right 519 and that looks quite focused here all right 
So if we got the focusing, let's uh, go ahead and now go to the alignment modulo, where this is most of the magic happens here. So this is where the all the plate solving is done in ECUS. And um, simply we have two modes. We have the go-to mode, which we'll be using today, and there is a parallel alignment mode to check your parallel alignment errors, which we're not going to be using today. So for the go-to mode, um, we simply have to uh, uh, select on successful solving what it needs to be what, what needs to be done. So we will say slew to target. So if it solves successfully, so it captures an image here, and it uses asymmetry.net either offline or online server. Here I'm using the offline server solver because it's um, it's a bit faster than the online solver. And then it will, so it will capture an image, solve it through asmrd.net, then it will get the solution coordinates back. After that, it will slow to the target, which is what we want. And let's let's just zoom in a bit here. The plate solving options, we just select the uh, CCD, the exposure time, one second, the pinning, really don't need one by one, that will take a long time, let's do it four by four. Here are the right ascension declination coordinates. It's there automatically filled because we said update chords. So every time we slow the target, it automatically fills the coordinates so that when we do solve the image, it's restricted to a specific region in the sky and that will make the solving process goes a lot faster. And here is uh, we check that we need to preview the image in uh, Fitz Viewer. Uh, just to know if there are any problems with the image because the solver can fail and if we can check the image we might have some idea what's going on wrong. So let's go ahead and uh, solve. So everything is set. Let's just capture and solve. So now it's capturing an image. Okay, it's warned me about some missing index files. And this is the image, and it's solved, and it's ah, it's looking now to the correct position in the sky. Okay, so this is where it should be actually uh, looking at. It. Now this is where it should be synced. So, just to be sure, let's go back to ECUS and CCD, and let's take a one second exposure. And actually, this is not not centered. It's not centered vertically. So um, let me just make sure it is. Let's let's go backtrack it again here. I think that moved a bit. Let's take an image here. And let's wait here to see if it changed. No, actually, let's solve that again. Maybe the first iteration of solving didn't work. So we simply click just capture and solve, nothing else. So it's capturing the image, starting the solver. Okay, and it's moved minutely there. Let's take another preview. Alright, so this is the image now, it's pretty centered. Okay, so I was observing uh, the cave nebula the other day and um, I'll continue to observe it today. So what I will do here, this is a really neat feature of the alignment modulo, is I will load the frame I want to go to previously. So I have an uh, H alpha frame that I will load. So what load 
and slew does is that it will load the frame solve the coordinates of that specific frame and then it will ask the telescope to go to the coordinates of this frame and then it will solve and check if it's really there so let's go ahead and do that so now it's solving the fits image I just selected there it's solved now it will slew actually to the location in that fits image which is the Cape Nebula frame in Cephas now it will take another image and it will make sure it actually matches the coordinates of the frame alright it's solved in two seconds and actually there was a slight discrepancy okay so now let's, let's look if we have the cave nebula there let's change the filter to H alpha let's take uh, 30 seconds exposure that's usually more than enough to resolve the nebula uh, I live in a really uh, heavily uh, light polluted area and today the moon is almost full but hopefully um, you can get something in 30 seconds ok it's almost done it's now downloading Okay, let's sort of stretch that. And okay, I can roughly see this is the outline of the cave nebula. And if you compare it to the previous image, so this is, you can see this is the image. This is five minutes exposure I captured the other day. So this is the cave nebula. And this is actually, it's really bad, but this is roughly where it is here. I can just see it there it's it's pretty much the same frame you can see the same stars located in the same place these three stars alright so that's that's really good well the next step we have to do is the auto guiding right so let's go to the guide modulo and the guide modulo we have to uh, well first of all here we select the guider we only want have guider we select via which means the guiding commands uh, go to the telescope via which device and I have the uh, guide cable going from the load star to the telescope water guide port the exposure is one second and here filters which is we have to apply to the image uh, for, for low star I usually use high contrast uh, let's take it without filters first and let's see it with high contrast then so let's capture an image uh, this is one me about uh, taking a dark frame. Actually, I don't need a dark frame for Old Star, but hold on. Yeah, so let's, let's just do that. Let's take another frame again here. So let's take a two second exposure. There we go. So this is the image that we see normally. And we can't see much here. But let's go ahead and apply a filter. So let's apply the high contrast and let's capture it again. And here we roughly see a couple of the stars. They're not really very clear. But any star will do. So this is a star on the edge, so it's not really recommended to choose anything on the edge. So let's select something um, otherwise. Um, let's, let's try uh, let's try three second exposure. Okay. I guess we can select a star. 
for the calibration procedure. So the calibration procedure, we select the square size, which I just changed to 16. The pulse in milliseconds, how much it has to pulse the uh, telescope. So 15 milli, uh, uh, 1500 milliseconds is what I usually use, but you might increase it as you, at your discretion. And here, how many iterations it has to do, so I usually use 5, which is the default value to the iterations. But then, uh, actually, I want to do just one second. Let me just look at the image in one second. Oh, that's really noisy. That's highly noisy. So that's not going to work. Let's, let's check two seconds. Yeah, two seconds would work. So, all right. So let's select Guide Star, and let's make this on top. Let's start the calibration procedure. Okay, so now it will move it in right ascension and then declination. And it's not moving, or is it? Actually, it's not moving, and I know why. Because I forgot to to put the the RJ11 uh, guiding cable in um, in the telescope, so it will fail now. Calibration projected star drift too short, but that's my my bad. I forgot to to hook in the cable. So let me um, I guess others oh, pause. Okay, um, back and I just connected the RJ11 or is it RJ12 guiding cable to the telescope. It wasn't even attached. So let's go ahead and uh, try this process again. Let's select the star. And hopefully now it will move. Okay, there we go. It's moving. So it first has to move in right ascension and then in declination now it's moving back in right ascension I'm just worried about declination because it has to go up and down it's really close to the edge I guess I could use this star here that's not bad or even this one here all these stars will do it's going down it's really close to the edge okay go back now all right so thankfully it didn't go over the edge that's good okay now it's going back to its original position Calibration should be complete soon, hopefully without errors. Okay. Calibration complete. Let's go to the guide page here. And here we see um, the drift graphics, which is it just uh, uh, displays the right ascension and declination errors of the guiding. Here we have some info about the telescope and the FOV, etc. etc. Here are the errors we have and pulse duration. Here we have the delta in arc seconds. And here we choose the, we do the setup for the controls. Of course, we enable directions for both right ascension and declination. This is a swap button in case the, uh, the algorithm actually try to determine which uh, uh, direction is for to use for declination was it positive direction or negative direction and that changes depending on your hemisphere or your north hemisphere or the southern hemisphere and whether you're um, looking at eastward or westward but that's usually determined automatically by the calibration procedure if something is wrong though and then you're 
gliding is, is going the wrong way, then you can swap the declination directions. So here in the setup, again, we... Let's center that again. Let's capture here. All right, let's select here. Okay, we select this, the square size, 32 is good enough. So the algorithm, we have many algorithms to check the centroid of the star. Uh, it's by default it's so using the smart algorithm, which is not very smart sometimes, but it's the uh, the best one in Equus so far. Um, here we choose to either do subframing or rapid guide. Uh, rapid guide is used when you want the CCD driver to do the actual guiding calculations, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So we'll just use the normal guiding for today. And here is the dither option. So it should dither two pixels randomly in any directions after each exposure. And we want to do that again to get rid of some CCD artifact like hot pixels and etc. It will help with the stacking process later on. Okay, so that's settled. Let's just capture again, see where it is now. All right, and let's just hit start other guy. Yeah, finally here here are some values for the uh, gain we want to send to the autoguider. These are some there is some documentation on how to vary these values to achieve optimal guiding performance. But I just use the default values in ECUS usually. So let's start the autoguiding here. And initially, it might uh, swing a bit, so you need you need you need to give it like a few seconds. I mean, like let's say 10 to 20 seconds for it to settle down. And you can see here from the drift graphics, it's a uh, it's initially not settled down. So um, let's get it sometimes until these values go down. Well, meanwhile, what we can do, we can go to the CCD module. This is the primary module in. Ecos and here we are going to select the exposure. So what we'll do, we will actually select a one by one pinning exposure, uh, five minutes, three hundred seconds. Uh, it will be the frame will be light, and here we select the name of the produced file. So what kind of prefix we will use? So this is actually sh one five five from the sharpless uh, catalog and here we will append the type of the frame which is light for example here and the filter and we can do the exposed duration but we don't need that and I will be capturing 5 here this is where the directory will be saved let's save it to this directory and here are some of the options. So, display and fits viewer. So it displays it every time it receives it. So we'll check this on. Maximum guiding deviation three arc seconds. So what this will do, if the guiding deviation here, see now it's nicely guiding. If the guiding deviation here exceeds three arc seconds. It will automatically abort any exposure. And once it goes below three arc seconds, it will automatically resume the exposure. So this is really neat when, um, in cases where, so you don't end up with really bad images, which will be a waste of time. You immediately abort if there is a bad image. Autofocus, this is the uh, in-sequence autofocusing that I talked about earlier. So this will perform autofocus if HFR is larger than specific value. So we didn't check our focusing actually. Let's, let's check again. So we move to a different place in the sky. So let's um, let's capture and let's select there we go. So this is the focus. Okay. Let's select it. I don't know why it's selected this area. Let's do that again. So capture and let me 
so let's, well, let's reset the frame. Oh, okay, so the frame was not reset, so reset the frame and capture again. Alright, so this is looks like a good start to do the focusing. Okay, five two five one nine, yeah, this is what we had before. So So let me go here and say it should autofocus if it's more than five for example two five. So that sounds like a good stuff and here park when complete so it will automatically park. So let me select the filter here. Let me select the pinning here again. So all values are fine. And here's the sequence queue which stores all the sequences we want to use. So let me add that one. So let's so let's see the filter H alpha light one by one 300 second exposure. There's no ISO. Let's do the same with sulfur and oxygen. And we can do a lot. And here we can load these these sequence sequences can be loaded and you can save them and load them um, for like future use. I think we're we're ready to capture. Let's go to the guiding. Guiding is really good now. Okay, so let's try out our exposure. Oh, well, this doesn't matter. It's already one by one here. But this gets updated. The values here gets updated every time we switch tabs. Okay. So let's start the sequence. And now it's starting to capture. And if we go to the in the control panel, QSI, you can check that the filter was indeed changed to number five, which is H alpha. And um, let me pause that, and we will come back again to check the results. See you in a bit. All right. So I'm back. We have about 10 seconds left for the five minutes exposure we took. The guiding still looks very nice. Okay, it's done exposing the first frame. It's downloading now from the QSI. And uh, the QSI takes a long, long time to download a full frame, about 20 seconds or so. And then after that 20 seconds, the uh, it has to be sent from the Raspberry Pi to ECOS, uncompressed. So that's uh, that could take a while, maybe an extra 10 seconds after that. You can see the filter is still at H alpha, didn't change to anything else. Okay. So we're just waiting until we're done. The first thing it does after that it goes and performs the dye drink. You can tell here from this image that it will move it a bit around in a random direction. It now actually suspended uh, guiding until this is downloaded. Alright, so now it's dye drink. Okay, so now it's actually moved it a bit. And after diving it is complete, it will perform a little check for the focusing. Alright, so see now it changed the filter to luminosity. It's done focusing. And now it's actually back to this one. So now it's 5.7, which is better than the value we had before. And so if it's if it's less than five two five it will not do autofocusing, it will just continue on. And now it's taking the second image. Let's look let's try to take a look at the uh, first image, where is that? 
Oh, it's over here. And and see, it automatically named it 04 because it checks the directory for the names of the files stored there before. Okay, let's make that a bit smaller. Uh, let's auto stretch. And okay, we see the nebula here. It doesn't look great with all the light pollution and moon. I know this is an edge alpha, but still. And this is exactly not a very bright nebula, the cave nebula. But um, I think the image I had before. Well, let's look at that one. Looks better. Yeah, this is definitely a lot better than this one. But we can see the frames are very close to being identical. All right, so so this is what a few nights does to your image. This is like I think um, a couple of days ago. This is the day with full moon. But um, so this is a, a quick demo on the features of Ecos, um, which is the tool I use every time when I do my astrophotography tasks. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this quick demo. There is a lot more to Ecos than meets the eye, uh, but this is a quick overview of the most common features of Ecos. And I invite you to go to Indie website, indielib.org, where you find a very active forum for users asking about Indie and Ecos and you can ask all kind of questions there we cover a lot of topics so thanks guys for watching um, this tutorial and uh, see you later